Hello and welcome to Series 9, Episode 3 of In Suspense, a podcast and vodcast for fans and writers of crime fiction. I'm Leslie Cara and I'm joined today by the rather lovely Nikki Smith. Hello, Nikki. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm probably going to be a little rusty at this because I haven't done it for a few weeks. You know, you and uh, Lauren have been marvellously holding the fort and and giving me a nice break. So thank you for that. (laughs) I've really enjoyed listening to you both. But uh, yeah, at least I managed to get the introduction out without blooping, which is very unusual for me. Now then, in our latest episode, not our last episode rather, Nikki and Lauren, you you talked to um, Amanda Reynolds, didn't you, about her latest novel, The Assistant, and the topic was writing for the modern reader, and what a fascinating discussion that was. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, So if you haven't heard that one yet, um, folks do tune in and listen to it, or watch it, or whatever you prefer to do, because it was fascinating. It was. It was really it was really interesting, actually, to talk to an author um, who's been both kind of traditionally published and indie published um, because she's had um, and she's had books made into a TV series and she does kind of mentoring for other people. So, um, yeah, it's a real wealth of experience and um, she had lots of good tips, I think, for other authors um, out there. Um, And I also have to mention that obviously Amanda is the first of our authors to be given the Leslie Cara social media (laughs) treatment um, with our new logo for In Suspense Um, and I'm not sure if anyone has seen it um, but we've changed to some gorgeous vibrant colours and um, we found a way of being able to kind of play back little videos of our guests well Leslie has found a way to play back videos of our guests so you're going to see those on Twitter, Insta and uh, Facebook. Yes. I I think it's more accurate to say that Canva Pro has found a way (laughs) <laughs> and Leslie has moved into uh, the, the deep and meaningful phase of her relationship with Campro. Finally got round to teaching myself how to use it. And actually, I'm quite addicted to it now. So, uh, yeah. Oh, good. good. Although I think yes. today is going to test me because, you know, having two, two, we've got two guests on today, which we'll tell you about in a minute. So, yeah, that's going to test me having two talking heads. Not sure if that. Yes, it's going to be interesting. I'm not sure whether we can fit them all in a square or a circle, but um, we'll just have to do our best. Well, do our best. <laughs> yes. But today we are tackling a very different subject indeed, because the subject for today's episode is serial killers, do's and don'ts. And Nikki, I hope you don't mind, but I've made the executive decision that we're not going to have a bash at that one on our own first, because I don't think either of us are experts at uh, talking about uh, crime. Um, well, hopefully we're experts at talking about crime fiction, but a serial killer fiction. <laughs> I think we're going to leave that to our two guests coming on. And we have got today, we've got Alice Hunter excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat today, Alice Hunter and Sam Holland, who are going to be coming on a little bit later. (laughs) Yes, um, yeah, I totally agree, Leslie. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in in that field. So let's leave it to Alice and Sam, who are going to kind of talk about that. And we're going to have plenty to discuss with them. But in the meantime, I want to hear all about Crime Fest, because I think you and Lauren went there for the first time last weekend. Um, And what was it like? Well, we did. It was our first time in uh, Crime Fest and my first time in Bristol. I think Lauren had visited Bristol before in the past, but I hadn't and I'd always wanted to go. Um, It was great. I mean, there's been a little bit of sort of stuff in the in the um, news lately on Twitter and and various things. Obviously, there was some some unpleasantness that went on um, in terms of one of the speeches and some behavior on one of the panels but um there's enough out there about that i don't really want to go into the details suffice to say it was a little bit upsetting but neither lauren nor i was sort of there in either of those bits of it and um you know i'd hate i'd hate for that to detract from what was actually a brilliant festival really well organized um i loved it actually because um it was a great opportunity because the panels, the, the makeup, the composition of the panels is really good. You've got sort of big names on with complete unknowns and debut authors. You've got some moderators who've never moderated before and they get a chance to sort of hone their skills really with, with some quite big names. So 
I think it's a really good festival and it bring you know brings people gives people the chance to to appear um, at a festival and, and develop their their panelist and moderating skills. Um, and um, yeah, we, Lauren and I were both on a couple of panels, so we watched each other's panels, which was great. I was on one with, um, well, I, I was last minute shoe in replacement for Adele Parks, so rather big shoes to fill. Um, so yeah, it was Lisa Jewell, myself, and um, oh gosh, who were the other guy? Oh, Paul Durston and, and um, Joe Furness. That's right. Um, and I, I got terribly confused and thought that I was on with Paul Burston, so promptly downloaded his wonderful book. <laughs> closer I get I must check that we must double check that it is called that but it was I started reading it absolutely loved it I've got to finish it because started reading it to prepare and then realized it wasn't Paul Burston it was Paul Durston who's a debut novelist um so yeah so that's me and my need to get my consonants right obviously but that was great because it was moderated by Lucy Martins and she's never moderated before and she was fantastic absolutely brilliant oh. asked some very funny questions um and yeah really good and then I think the next day I was on one with Jackie Carbler the, the something about psychological threat I mean it was great it was it was a really good good experience and we had a lovely meal and just I had a little wander around Bristol and by the water and uh, yeah the weather wasn't brilliant but it was yeah no it's such a beautiful city isn't it i know i set my debut novel there actually and um yeah it's gorgeous like clifton and um yeah around the yeah around there it's absolutely stunning um and as you say i think it's really nice to have a festival where it does give people who haven't had the chance um to go on a panel because you know the panels are very difficult to get um onto and so i think it's lovely that people have a chance to do that and speak and you know get to moderate it's yeah i think it's absolutely. good really good yes yes, yes. So while uh, Lauren and I have been pretending to work in <laughs> Bristol, what, what have you been up to, Nikki? Um, well, I have been working on a synopsis uh, for my next book, um, which unlike um, Lauren, I find a very slow process. Um, so um, I've just been taking my time about it and kind of thinking about everything and characters and plot. I find it, you know, it just takes a while for me to kind of mull over things and um, work out how it's going to work. Um, so I've been doing that. And then I also had the opportunity to go up um, and see my audio book recorded for the beach party, um, which was lovely. I've never done that before. So I went up to the Penguin Studios in London. Um, it's like the big building. Um, and then you kind of go up different floors and they've got all these little um, little pods, I think I'd call them. And um, yeah, and then they're kind of the person who's recording the audio book sits in one side of the pod and the producer's just outside and it's all soundproofed and you can shut the doors and things so um yeah i was lucky enough to meet um it's being recorded by an actress called monse lombard who was in a tv series called ashes to ashes years and years ago so some of our kind of more older listeners like myself will probably remember that uh, with Keely Hawes and Philip Glenister. I loved her, absolutely loved her in that. So yeah, it was a bit of a fangirl moment to be able to say, oh my goodness, I can't believe you're reading my, yeah, reading my yes. book. Um, it's, it's such fun, isn't it? Listening to it being recorded. And it's it's hard work because you think, you know, I, I thought at once, oh, you know, I'd be able to narrate one of my books. Actually, no, it's really hard work you know, reading aloud for such a long period of time. Absolutely. Yeah. And and multiple characters, you know, which mm. my book has, you know, doing the different voices and being able to switch in and out of yes. those consistently. And there's absolutely no way I could do anything like that. No, she was she was brilliant. But it's it's really surreal, I think, isn't it, Leslie? It is. Hearing it your is. own words read out by somebody else is it's wonderful, but it's, it's the most surreal experience. So it's a yes. lovely you'll always remember it. It's a lovely, lovely yes. experience. Yes, I, yes. I to Claire Corbett um, narrating oh, wow. parts of the room, but yeah, and I loved yeah. it. It was fantastic. Uh, yeah, fantastic. yeah, real. Yes, yes, an author goals moment. I think that is. <laughs> um, but now I think it's probably time that we should get today's guests on um, and start tackling the grisly topic of serial killers. So welcome to In Suspense, Alice Hunter and Sam Holland. <laughs> Welcome Alice Hunter and Sam Holland to In Suspense. We're delighted to have you both on the show today and um, in line with our new way of doing things we'd love it if you introduced yourselves by reading out your biographies. So shall we start with you Alice? You can read it out anything you like, just want to 
readers and listeners to know a bit more about you. Okay, I'm Alice Hunter. I am the author of the Serial Killer Family series. And although that is not quite a series, so it is a link, it's, they're linked rather than like an actual series. But as it is, the serial killer's um, wife was first, then the serial killer's daughter, and now the serial killer's sister. Um, my background is um, in, a, I worked in the prison. Um, I was a nurse as well at one point. So I've had a little bit of a different background uh, that brought me to writing. But it was my present background that's really been the key thing with writing these novels. Um, I live in Devon uh, with my husband and dogs. And I've got a grown up family. And I'm now grandmother as well. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm also doing an MA in screenwriting, which is my new thing at the moment. So that's... Uh, a little add-on at the moment so that's keeping me busy and thank you very much for that Alice so your latest book um is the serial killer's sister isn't it so yeah. um I just wondered if you could tell our viewers and listeners a little bit more about it so yeah the serial killer's sister um this is basically following a traumatic childhood Anna Price is now living in an, an idyllic life um in a coastal village um she is a teacher in a nearby village as well her husband is a local estate agent and everything is going hunky-dory for her sticking along nicely until uh, a knock on the door as there always is <laughs> um di walker shows up with the police at her door and he's telling her that her estranged brother henry is a wanted serial killer so then goes that whole kind of thing of um a cat and mouse kind of um chase because it's a countdown to his next murder so he's been killing sort of two um women a year for the past three years one of them is on anna's anna's birth date every year and another is four days away so there's a big countdown going on so it's trying to get um she's working with the police to try and catch him basically before he kills again and there's a, a kind of game that comes along then that she realizes that he's playing a game that they used to play when they were children and that is a key thing that makes her think that the next victim could be her. Ooh. Well, it's a great book, Alice, with a fantastic twist. So if anybody hasn't read it, um, then, you know, do get it because it's a, you know, it's a real treat that you've got in store. But before we go on to Sam, who's waiting to come on um, and tell us all about her latest novel, um, can you just, Alice, tell us a little bit about the origin st um, story of this series and how it came to be, The Serial Killer Family? Because it's, it's quite an interesting tale, isn't it? It is. Um, so the publisher, Avon HarperCollins, um, they obviously know my background in, in working in a prison. So they actually approached me to write The Serial Killer's uh, Wife. <laughs> so that was the first one. So that kind of came about. So it's almost like they thought about the branding of that. So rather than me just writing my usual psychological thrillers, which I write under Sam Carrington, um, they wanted to have a different kind of take on and use basically my background and enable me to really focus on serial killing. Not that I actually worked with serial killers, I must just say. I have worked with murderers, but not actual serial killers that I am aware of. Um, so it was just like using my my background, I suppose, really, that you know enabled me to bring that forward. And the premise was such an easy premise. It was a what if kind of premise where, you know, that you've got that perfect or seemingly perfect family and what if a member of the family, it's something they've done that then creates all this hassle in your own life. So it's not necessarily what that person's done, it's what a family member has done. So the key thing was like focusing on a different member of the family for each book. So I guess there's there's scope for quite a few relatives to... But there is <laughs> jokes for a lot of relatives, but the, the standing joke seems to be uh, the serial killer's cousin twice removed. Um, so... <laughs> I, I, you can't really go too far with the uh, brand, I don't think, because otherwise you'd be, you know, it would be a bit ridiculous, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, I think we did have a good idea for the serial killer's dog, but, you know, that's another story. Oh, <laughs> now that, that that's, sounds That's quite a good one, actually. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, 
Excellent. So, Sam, um, it's your turn to read your biography now. So off you go. OK, um, my name's Sam Holland. I'm the author of the uh, Major Crimes series, which starts with uh, the Echo Man and uh is so the current one is the 20 which came out i think two weeks ago now nearly two weeks ago now um i am also the author of a lighter police procedural series called butler and west i write as louisa scar and the next in that series is out on the 6th of july so um about me not particularly interesting i live in hampshire with my husband and son and dog who is currently thinking about misbehaving so it's currently in the room um I do a lot of running the weather's just getting nicer so I do uh run uh swimming in ponds so but only like now when it's starting to be sunny but yeah that's that's pretty much about it <laughs> oh fantastic um yes we met Max just before um we started yeah. recording the podcast and he's very gorgeous I have to say and he's being very quiet and good as well at the moment he's very quiet um, and good. I do have a supply of treats here which I'm <laughs> <laughs> dropping into his bed so that's kind of keeping him like behaving <laughs> um and as you said the 20 um your book is available right now so would you like to tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about it sam yeah so the 20 this is the 20 uh it begins as um, a dci called adam bishop is called out to um, a crime scene in the middle of the night to a waste ground where a body has been discovered and he quickly realizes that not only are there another four so five in total but that there are spray painted numerals above each body and the killer is counting down so um the investigation begins and uh, Adam is approached by a woman who happens to be his ex-wife and she is convinced that this new spate of killings is connected to one uh, from 20 years ago, uh, which she is personally connected with, that were carried out by a serial killer who is now locked away and in prison. So it's about the intersection between these two cases and uh, if you've read The Echo Man, you sort of know what you're letting yourself in for. So it's very dark very violent um but very pacey like it licks along at a good at a good at a good pace so um yeah it's a good fun I think it's fun um <laughs> thriller very dark <laughs> fantastic um and it features some of the characters doesn't it from your debut the echo man but it's very much a standalone novel um so what made you choose to have a different DCI in this one and can you tell us a little bit more about Adam Bishop as a character yeah, um, so it was always designed as a standalone and um, Adam very much uh, was one of those characters, actually Adam, Jamie and Romilly, who are the three main characters in this, they very much arrived as sort of like pre-made. So they were there from the beginning and they're definitely the right people to tell the story. So it was always designed as a sort of standalone and it explores, it goes into quite a lot between um, Adam and his second in command, Jamie, and their relationship, but then also Adam and Romilly, so with his ex-wife. Um, and it's how that this case sort of pulls on all their lives and basically destroys all of them, <laughs> um, which is always, you know, always nice. Um, so, yeah, it was designed as a standalone. But then when I was writing it, I did want it to link with the Echo Man. And I wanted to create this world where they all exist in each other's universe but they all sort of move in and out in a series where you kind of get to play with whichever character you fancy so um none really of the the original characters from Echo Man are in it except Kara makes a few sort of cameos so she sort of comes in and they talk about the Echo Man case and but without spoilers obviously yeah. um, and then she sort of goes away again and comes out in at the end so if you've read the Echo Man you get that little sort of like easter egg of Taste. somebody from that world yeah. But it, pretty much it's written as a standalone. I like that idea of having yeah. the, the, the world, but it's not sort of a series in a traditional sense then, is it? But it, it is a series, but it, the characters, as you say, you can come in home in and out on different... A bit yeah. like Marvel, really. Yeah, well, that, that was sort of my thinking. It's yeah. a bit like Marvel or DC in that they have their own they have their own world. But yeah, you just pull on which character and you dig into that person's life a little bit more, which again, hopefully we'll do in like the third and um, see where it goes from there. But yeah, that, that's sort of the plan. So we might lose a few people <laughs> along the way. So well, it definitely yeah. gives the illusion that nobody is safe, you know. Yes, there. yes that's good. And was yeah. there um, any kind of specific incident or idea that first prompted your idea for the 20 is very um, kind of compelling idea yeah there wasn't an incident that makes it sound you know hopefully nothing like the 20 will ever happen in my life um <laughs> but the, the I guess the source of inspiration was it was two things one where I go running um with the dog is a 
uh, forest and it's managed by the Forestry Commission. And I, I don't understand what they do for tree management, but what they do do is they write numbers on the trees. I assume it's to mark which one needs pruning or something, anyway, something. <laughs> um, but in my mind, of course, being a crime writer, you immediately think, well, this is where somebody's burying the bodies, or at least I did. So there were all these numbers, you know, 51, whatever. And originally the idea was to count down from 100, but I did want to get to the end. I did want to get to zero. So obviously I had to lower my expectations down to 20, 20 the realistic number you can drop down from. Um, so yeah, so that was the sort of the idea. I mean, originally it was in a forest, but then the Echo Man's quite foresty. So I kind of moved it um, and moved it to these kind of spray painted numbers. But I mean, that was the first one. And then the second idea, which is quite spoilery, but um, I wanted to explore how people are often... Um, not as we think they are and how you can see one person on the surface but have a very different sort of core or something that's happened to you in the background and how that can change depending on the influence that comes to you so this idea came from um, and I've talked about it so much I hope he doesn't mind but my step-brother-in-law is an um, anaesthetist sorry it's, it's took me three years for now to pronounce it anaesthetist. <laughs> and he works with needles all day obviously you know injecting people or whatever but the thing about um him is if you come at him with a needle or give him an injection he passes out so he you know he he has to warn doctors this is what happens he he's a six foot quite large bloke and he will go down like a like literally like a tree so it was this sort of like bizarre why would you you know why would you then become a an aesthetist if you have a you know a problem with needles so it's this, this sort of strange dichotomy that you get from people that I was really interested in exploring in the 20s so it's, yeah it was those two ideas I guess came together and you have this that's really, book. That's really <laughs> I love how that happens when you've just got some random it's kind of random isn't it and then you know yeah. you've built this whole thing around it it's great I love it yeah I hope he doesn't mind I basically He'll take it stuck yeah. in the book. He's famous now <laughs> I bet he yeah. likes it really. Yeah. The book's dedicated to him, so I'm sure he'll tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got to ask you both, and I'm sure you've both been asked this a million times, but what is it, you know, why is it that we are so, so many of us are fascinated by by the subject of serial killers? Should we start with you, Alice? Because, I mean, I know, you know, you were telling us earlier that your publishers suggested or asked you to write this series, but obviously they knew because of your prison background, it was something that would interest you. But was it directly as a result of your work in prisons that first sort of sparked the interest in serial killers? Or did it happen earlier? Was it something that you've always been fascinated by? It's really hard to pinpoint now, I think, because maybe it has been probably since college years, maybe when I started taking psychology. Um, mm -hmm. I did CCSE, like, you know, as an add-on at college. Um, so that beca I became interested in just general sort of psychology and why we do what we do. So I'm, but I can't quite remember when that went into thinking about people who kill. So, oh, it's hard, isn't it? Because I, I did my nursing and I went on to do my psychology degree. And even then, I still hadn't, I watched things on TV and I listened to a lot of things and I read books about um, murder, but not necessarily serial killer kind of things. So I don't know whether it might have even been um, Silence of the Lambs. I went to see that when I was 18. And I think maybe there might be something there, that fascination. And I think it was born of fear. You know, these are the things that I worry about. <laughs> like when I go out, I'm you think about the fact that you know you could be followed or you, something bad can happen so I don't know whether some of it is to do with that and that's why we're quite fascinated by things it's trying to explain like we're trying to find understanding in, in things and when they're quite extreme like kill, being killed you know that is something maybe that we we can focus on and just try to understand by writing about it um but yeah I, I think Obviously, from from the actual writing side of it, it was because of my job. Um, yeah, you know, I worked with uh, in a male prison, and I was doing, I was facilitating sort of group sessions and working with about eleven or so men, um, varying obviously varying um, issues and things that was go that were going on for them. But a key thing was working with a group of um, lifers, which I think really made me look at individuals and like they're entire like holistically 
history, like their entire life, things that have gone on for them in the background, how they got to where they've got to. Um, and that kind of fascination, I think, came from, from there. Um, and then since then, we've obviously had lots of things like on Netflix and God knows how much things in terms of true crime. So yes. that's then fed into that. So, yeah, I think that's just yeah. basically come from there, really. Yeah. Or I'm just a very dark person. I don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I think Sam, I think Sam can probably be darker than me, though. I haven't written <laughs> books. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So what about you, Sam? Was it, I mean, was it, was it a, you know, a particular case or story that sort of sparked off your interest or were, as a child were you saying mummy read me a story about ted bundy <laughs> well i mean i wasn't i wasn't quite that bad but like um alice it's quite hard to pinpoint when but as a child i was always very interested in the slightly macabre side of things like um and uh, my parents didn't well i was gonna say they didn't encourage it but to a certain extent I, like they did my dad gave me a book when i was quite young that was about uh, poisons and uh, their various effects. I don't know how old I was. I still got it on the shelf somewhere. Um, but and I was fascinated in pathology and um, you know the mechanics of death and what happens after death and post mortems. And I was always like fascinated by all that sort of thing. So I don't know. I think it just felt like a very natural fit when I just started writing about them and then reading about them. And um, I you know I did psychology at university as well. And it's that interest into why people do what they do and this is you know this is the very worst of human behavior that we can possibly you know it's absolutely abhorrent but you look at these people and say why why is it that you do this but yet I don't and that there are many theories about it which is fascinating I won't go off on a on a tangent about why serial killers are serial killers but um part of I think why uh, society in general is interested in again there are loads of theories but the one that I think um, holds mo most with me and, and Alice was talking about it is about this um, so Professor Wilson talks about a protective frame so we read when we read about something awful or we watch it like true crime or all these documentaries on Netflix we get to experience all the emotions of it so the fear the horror the anger the whatever but we're experiencing it in a very safe environment so we're at home on our sofa and that experience can be, you know, it can be a relief or it can be cathartic because, you know, as women, we're very used to, as Alice said, walking down the road and feeling fear. So to experience it in a nice warm house um, can be, you know, quite a relief and even enjoyable. So I, 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 that is this protective frame theory that I quite like. Um, and there's another theory that uh, detective stories or serial killer stories are very they sort of model the whole human condition. You have your heroes, your villains, the puzzle in the middle, and humans love to solve puzzles. Um, we love to find solutions. And then it has a happy ending, so, or usually has a happy ending, I should say, because I don't always. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, it's a wonderful sort of experience for, for the, you know, for humans, I guess. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it is, it is, I find, I must say, I find serial killers fascinating. And, you know, I know there's been, you know, they had Dharma, didn't they, on um, Netflix? And um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, all of um, yeah. There's a lot actually um, recently that have been on TV, kind of thing. And I think it's it's just I think it's that as you say, there's a real desire to kind of understand why people, why those kind of people do what they do. But at the same time, I don't think most people can ever understand why they do because I don't think they probably understand why they do what they do either so it's one of those almost unsolvable like unanswerable kind of puzzles um yeah I mean, still, I mean there's various theories and I think a, a lot of them have come close to actually answering the question of why you know you you might have somebody from one background and somebody from another so Jeffrey Dahmer had a brother called David and David as far as we know didn't go out and kill people but yet Jeffrey Dahmer did so what is it that makes that them have different different lives different experiences um, but, but yeah it's fascinating yes yeah, I think that's what I found fascinating working with prisoners is the backgrounds because like you said there can be different factors I suppose if everything came together to a head that that could make somebody do something that another person might not do so it's almost like a perfect storm of yeah. factors that could um, result in them doing something that we perhaps wouldn't but then yes. that makes me always think well in that case for somebody like you or I if all those factors came together would would we do something 
there's, there's, a, there's a really that's, that's the question isn't it yeah the theory that i i really like um i can't remember who put it but it's that um inherently all humans are we are trained to kill because that's what you know we as evolution we would have had to kill but the difference between serial killers and uh, somebody is we've been socialized out of it so it's not that they're abhorrent is that we're abhorrent because we've been socialized not to kill because of good upbringing and the fact that we have friends and we, you know, we like that sort of, that sort of connection. So actually that we're, we're the odd ones to evolution and you should be killing people because they're your competition. They, you know, you could eat them. You know, well, anyway, it's a really odd, fun theory that I kind of quite like. Gosh, that's really <laughs> interesting. It is. And what yeah. you were saying, both of you, about the, the, the danger, you know, that we, that, that we sort of are experiencing um, through reading, you know, because, it, you know, back in the, you know, ages ago, ages when we were sort of, you know, having to fend for ourselves in sort of the wild, you know, we would be sort of open to sort of danger all the time, wouldn't we? Wild animals and pe being attacked and things. And we have that sort of sense. I know, you know, you were saying earlier, Alice, when you're walking down the road as women, we feel unsafe. And I, I, I don't know about you, whenever I park, pass a parked van, I always, in my head, I'm thinking now, what if someone suddenly leapt out of that van and but tried to bundle me in what would I do and it's awful isn't it that we're thinking of these things I actually had that though no I wasn't bundled in oh god <laughs> I was walking through because I live in a village and I was walking in any lanes like quite far out of the village um and I remember it was pouring down the rain and a white van kept driving past so it would go past and then a few minutes later would come back again and I was I was having all those thoughts and another thing mobile phones Everyone always goes, oh, mobile phones that don't work. You know, there's no signal. But there actually isn't <laughs> always signal where I live. So I had my phone out and there was no signal. I was thinking, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But he did come back and he did stop and he did say, do you want a lift? Oh, no. Like, no. No, there's that house over there. Thanks. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. It's like your heart is in your mouth. And yeah, it's just like proper. It, it, it is scary and it is whether we're conditioned to, to that or not, or whether it's an in, innate sort of thing. But yeah, I think the more we watch about these things, the more you hear about them. I mean, the percentage is quite low, isn't it, of, of serial killers, let's face it. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. extreme, yeah. thankfully. It's like extreme and that thought that it could happen is, is yeah. enough, I think. Yes. Yes. Um, and I heard you interviewed on um, another podcast recently, Sam, when you said that you um, you can't watch horror or very grisly films. And yet you write some of the most graphic scenes um, ever <laughs> in your book. So how does that work? Um, I, honestly, I don't know. I, I used to watch a lot of horror when I was younger and I certainly used to read it, still read it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's something to do with the experience. So when you watch a film, it's sort of done to you isn't it you have to you're sat there as very passive whilst when you're a reader you're very active and especially when I'm writing something I'm very active in it so I can control it so I think it's something to do with the difference of that um, and also visually it's very it's a very different experience um, and I look for different things I think my imagination is is probably worse than what presented on the screen but I don't know I just I don't find it particularly um entertainment to watch to watch a film I like to watch like crap when I'm watching but books I'm a little bit more like and you, if you get to a nasty book in a book you can either flick or you can put the book down or whatever you have a little bit more control but in a horror film it just feels all the dogs back it just feels I'm um, sorry it just feels more I don't know I'm not 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 so can't not so happy about it hello yes. yeah interesting interesting yes because I th often think actually reading the experience of reading things is often worse I think than watching scary I mean I love horror films and I'll watch watch anything going but I think that reading is worse because you create the characters and the situation is so much left to your imagination that I think that that can be worse than actually being kind of presented with it on a plate on the screen kind of thing um it, but is it the same for you Alice do you do you watch I, horror or I do but to a degree I mean like I could not watch the Saw films or anything like oh, that. No, that no 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 can't do it and I so I don't know whether that's because it's too graphic and just needless I don't know but oh yeah no so I can't watch a lot because I I start putting myself in there I start thinking how must that feel and I, I think I actually start to feel some of it, and I just think, oh, no, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> writing, I think Sam's right. I, you've, got, you've got the control yourself. When you're writing it, 
It's I could probably write a Saw film, probably, yeah. fairly happily, but I, I'm not sure. I Yeah, I could definitely. I've never watched a Saw film, never. It's weird. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm i not into graphic gore. I like, I'm like you. I'm like you, Alice. I, I feel it viscerally, every yeah. sort of horrible thing. I, I think, yeah. and I, I can watch those sorts of things. I don't particularly like it. I can watch them, but my husband can't watch horror films or any film that sort of people jump out because I, I'm really unbearable to be with because I scream and I leap <laughs> up and he just says, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got screaming now I'm older. I don't know what that's about. So I never used to scream, but now I do. I'm not allowed to go to the cinema anymore just in case I scream. <laughs> I <know. laughs> No, I'm really interested to know, we've kind of touched on it a bit with Sam and her brother. I'm really interested to know what your family and friends think of your books. You know, do they read them? Were they shocked when they first read them? What What are their reactions? I mean, what, who wants to who wants to go with that one first? I think people are going to be more shocked at Sam, so I'm going to let Sam go first. <laughs> um yeah I mean I get I get some responses that people are a little bit surprised um more I think when I meet other writers and they meet me they think I'm going to be like right look like Chris Carter or whatever um I mean he like models that he's definitely the model for what you should look like um no I mean my brother won't read them uh he won't go near them just because he doesn't like that sort of thing and he, he won't touch it. Um, my mum used to have something to say about the language, but only that um, she said I didn't vary it enough. So she said I always used fuck. She said there's so many other wonderful swear words. Why do you always have to use fuck? I was like, okay, I'll branch out and really like be a bit more uh, flowery, shall we say, with my swear words. But um, my husband, a lot of people ask him whether he's worried about being murdered or not. But... Um, <laughs> As I point out, you know, if I was going to kill him, I wouldn't, you know, I would be a little bit more inventive and nobody would know. So it would be fine um, for me. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I generally get a lot of reactions, but I just find it fairly amusing, to be honest. Alice, what about you? Um, my husband doesn't read, he has read one, um, but he doesn't, he does non-fiction. So it's not his type of thing. That's his excuse and he's sticking to it. Uh, my daughter-in-law reads all of mine um and she she gives me like her feedback and she seems to like them so that's good uh, and my friends I've got a couple of friends that are really into to the books and they they're keen on reading and nobody's shocked no but oh. <laughs> I don't know whether that's because they've kind of got used to the fact now I've talked about murder for so long that maybe they're just <laughs> not surprised um yeah. I, yeah I don't think so I don't think anybody's surprised at all um, uh, my parents, unfortunately are no longer with me uh, I think they would have been surprised <laughs> <laughs> oh. no one ever knows. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I'm keen to find out about is um, how you manage to find a balance between the kind of graphic violence that you need to write about for these kind of books and um, and then but also not running the risk of being too gratuitous um, with it. Do you um, find yourself or your editor, do you ever kind of cut bits out or feel you haven't gone far enough and have to add more? Do you want to start with that, Alice? Um, it is quite a balance, I think. Um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, I think, with the book. Um, I think for the Serial Killer family series, it has been more of a focus on one of the family members that's not the serial killer, um, and how everything has affected them. I don't know if that is probably due to my work as well, because obviously I work with um, the, the perpetrators of crime um, and I didn't work with the victims. So that gave me a difference there. So now whether I'm thinking, I don't know, I want, maybe don't want to focus so much on the on the perpetrator. So I, I tend not to be too gratuitous. I don't think I'm gratuitous anyway. I, I mean, some of the chapters are probably quite dark and particularly with Sarah and his sister I think there's a lot more description and I think Sam was saying as well, um, earlier about like being kind of intrigued with the body systems and I having been a nurse I did see some post-mortems so there is quite a lot of a, a I think that comes through in this particular book maybe um, but yeah the balance is basically that the chapters are all, they're not all from the killer's point of view or anything like yeah. that. So you're getting, in this particular one, you've got Anna's point of view. And in the first one, it was the wife's point of view. And the second was the daughter. So 
it's more about the psychological aspect of it as opposed to the the murders themselves yeah um, but yeah i've still got some i nobody's asked me to take anything out um and i've had some readers say oh you could go darker i think so I think I, <laughs> there's, there's a balance isn't there it's really hard there is. to know there because is. i don't I don't want it to come across as oh look I'm killing people for entertainment um and particularly women because at the moment with you know the way things are you don't want to necessarily be always having a victim as a women, woman but yeah. they do tend to be in my books <laughs> so yeah I think the balance is difficult but you can't get it right all the time you're gonna some people are gonna like that part some people are not gonna like that part so I think I do what I want to do and then hopefully other people agree yes basically. indeed, and I, have indeed. Read Sam's book. I have read sam's book and obviously there is a, <laughs> there is quite a bit of a difference but i think there's something for everybody and i think it, it depends where you are on that kind of extreme of, of what you like and mm. yeah i'm I'm in the mid middle part i'd say <laughs> <laughs> how about you sam where are you middle I, end I, I, well i mean it's interesting that you've got both of us on because i've read um alice's book as well and i think whilst i am probably the far end sort of verging into horror i think alice is probably more at that end verging into more the sort of psych thrillerish. um but i guess it's the book you want to write so when i set out i deliberately wanted to induce an, a reaction in the reader i didn't want them to put the book down and go yeah I wanted them to have a reaction, whether it's disgust or horror or fear, or I wanted to, to have this visceral sort of reaction in them. So going very dark was a conscious decision and I didn't want to hold back. Um, serial killers in their nature are very nasty and violent and I didn't want to sanitize that. So while you do see um, points of view from the from the victims and from the detectives dealing with it um there's and there was a couple of things that I wanted to make sure I did one was to not always kill women because as, as Alice noted it is hard because the majority of victims are women mm -hmm. but I did want to be a sort of equal opportunities sort of killer so <laughs> there are a lot of men that get killed but also have a very hard time so both in the Echo Man and uh, the 20 there are men that have a horrible time in it um I wanted the reactions of the detectives to be in line with how they would so I didn't want anyone saying hey this is cool but you know they all react in the way that you would expect they're absolutely horrified they find them very evil they find them you know at the core they're they're horrible um and all the action or the kills I did want to make sure that they're integral to the plot so there's nothing that happens nobody dies just for the hell of it and actually in the, the Echo Man, there was one scene where there was something that wasn't integral to the plot. And we, between myself and my editor, we said, cut that. So that it is still a very graphic chapter, but it's not as graphic as it was. And there is there is it isn't as pointless as it was, I guess. And then in the 20, um, the, the contentious issue is I originally killed a dog. And, um, and so my editor said, OK, you can kill the dog, but be aware of the repercussions that you will experience. I was like, no, fine. Dog, dog doesn't have to die. The dog lives. So the dog, the dog lives. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> is killed. So that's sort of, I guess, the rules that I stick to. But again, I think it's a very thin line between gratuitous and and but that was the book I wanted to write, and that's the books I do write. So um yeah. yeah. It's funny, it's funny actually. I think um readers' reaction to killing dogs is far worse than readers' reaction to killing people every time. Oh yeah. I There's have done it once. I have to, I've done it once as well. And yes, got a, a one-star review. Yes. Oh. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I expected <laughs> with the Echo Man, I did expect to get a lot more one-star reviews than I did. I thought there'd be a lot of people saying, no, this this book is sick or whatever. Um, but actually, I think you know, if you can get through the prologue and the first chapter of the Echo Man and similarly for the 20, you sort of know what you're letting yourself in for and you're along for the ride and off you go. It's the people that get to the epilogue and go, This is a disgusting book. And it's like, but you read the whole thing. Like it's not a short book, it's like 400 pages. You read the whole thing and then they started and said it's disgusting. It's like yeah. okay. 
people, people are weird. Uh, now just, <laughs> that's my verdict. Now, I've just remember that our topic for today is serial killers do's and don'ts. So um, because we've got a lot of, you know, writers listening and um, I wondered if you could give any advice to those of our listeners who might want to be writing a novel about serial killers, because I'm presuming that like any crime subgenre, there are certain tropes that you might want to avoid or can you avoid them? I don't know. I mean, are there any tips for would-be would be serial killer fictionistas? I think mainly like do some research on actual serial killers. Um, because in like on on film and things, you've got quite extremes and maybe like Hannibal Lecter, although I love that film, I do love that film, um, he is an extreme kind of killer and that tends to be what happens in any media. There'll be that will be picked up on, and, and everyone thinks that they're going to look odd, or they're going to you're going to know a serial killer when you see one. And actually, you know, they're quite normal looking, and some can live among us, and you know, have a family and a job and all those sorts of things. So it's like thinking that they don't have to look any different than anybody else. I mean, obviously you can make them like that, but you don't have to. And um, I think maybe it's just a case of looking at some not just the, the major ones like Bundy and everything, although I do also look <laughs> at Bundy because <laughs> he epitomises all of those things, but um, it's just to look at all the other ones as well and, and like see what other kind of serial killers there are. That I mean, there's not a whole load, is there? Like I said, there's not going to be a, a load of people to look at, but maybe it's just not such, not the common ones, if you see Yeah. And look at the more... Very yeah, I mean, I guess if you look at someone like Harold Shipman, you know, I mean, yeah. he had a job, he, you know, had a family, he was well respected in the community, nobody would have ever thought that he'd have done something like that, and he did. And so. scary ones, I think. Yeah. Scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, to echo Alice, my my favorite would to do your to do your research, but also on the things like police procedure and but because what one, one of my bugbears is. The police proceed. I'm not. I'm not an expert by any means, but I know the basics and the people that write. Because serial killer thrillers tend to have a detective, and there tends to be an element of police procedure in it. So, do your research in that and get to know like the main basic legislation, like Pace and Lip Ripper, and you know, learn that you if you like why you can arrest someone. Sorry, this is my bugbear. So I go on rants on it, but <laughs> you know. Caution, caution your suspects. The amount of books I've read where they don't do a basic caution just drives me nuts. Um, because, you know, it's it's like, it's, it's the thing. But I think in terms of tropes, which you were talking about, Leslie, the, I think it's hard to avoid them because you get the, I mean, my favourite, and I love it, is the dark, disturbed detective with the past. And I love it. I adore it. I love it when people write it and I like writing it myself. But I guess the key is, to try and make it a believable and b be original. So if they have an addiction, why is you know why is it? I've read books where they have problems, and you're like, well, why? Why is why have you put that in the book? It's just you've just thrown it in for the hell of it. But you know, make it so it's integral to the plot and it's integral to that. Why is that detective the only person that can solve that crime? Um, which is the, the the thing that I've always found fascinating. Yeah. And in terms, you know, and the the Hannibal Lecter thing is another trope the person in prison which I've done myself in the 20 you know I've got a serial killer in prison but again it's fascinating for a reason and try and make it original and try and make it a little bit different make it your own somehow I think you're right these tropes they're in every genre aren't they and they are useful and can be done really well it's just how you how you include them isn't it yeah I think a bit of thought yeah yes trying to be original yes definitely um and I'd love to ask you both who are your favorite serial killer novelists either past or present I go (laughs) go for it Alice I did like Thomas Harris. I mean, I do like Thomas Harris. Yeah. Um, but I think now, now probably more, we get sent so many, so many books as well by authors. To, to blurb with that, so Sam is obviously one of my favourites now. And, um, oh, I know, uh, what is it called? I want to say Sven. Oh, he did the Chestnut Man. Sven? Soren. Oh. Soren. Sven Strip. Yes, I think so. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll, we'll find out and we'll put it in. Yeah, the, yeah, the, chest, the chestnut man, I really, really, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was very clever and I just, yeah, found that fascinating. Um, oh, and I also, um, N.V. Peacock, he did the, 
Why can I never remember? <laughs> so little, bones. Little, little bones, and that was really good. I enjoyed that. That was um, ah. a little nice serial killer thriller. So that was okay. really good. Well, those are ones to watch out for. How about you, Sam? Um, so the, the originals, I mean, obviously Science, uh, Science of the Land, but American Psycho is also a brilliant example of a, um, a serial killer thriller that's just that little bit different and has a great sort of twist at the end. And I, But I read it so long ago and I haven't dared to read it again because it just terrified me so much. I think I've got it, but I haven't. I need to read it again. Um, but more recently, I think Nadine Matheson, um, her books are fantastic. I really enjoy those. And um, Thomas Enger, he writes a great series, of, it's called Blick and Ram with, um, they're not necessarily, they're more detective police procedurals, but they're Norwegian, I want to say. Um, and it's just slightly different, slightly different style. I mean, like Alice, I do get sent to quite a lot of serial killer books, but I don't tend to read them because I'm normally writing one and I worry that what I'm yeah. right, reading will bleed into what I'm writing. So I tend not to read them. Um, I just read A Half Burnt House by Alex North, which I thought was great. I really like, I really like The Whisper Man and I really enjoyed that. Oh, yeah, no, I, I like that. that. I like that, yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Nesbo as well. I mean, I think, you know, that's the, the, the snowman was pretty Yeah. Good. And there's a lot of those have actually been made into films or TV shows <laughs> as well, actually. Yeah, so that's interesting. Very visual, aren't they? I mean, we always try to round off each episode by asking, I guess, what's what they're currently reading. You might have mentioned some of them already. I don't know. But are you currently reading any other type of novels or any anything you want to share with our listeners or viewers? Sam, what are you uh, up to? Oh, sorry. Um, I just finished a uh, romantic comedy, which obviously is not oh. a serial killer thriller, <laughs> but is excellent. So I do love, I do love a good romance. Um, so when I saw that was everywhere and lots of people saying it was brilliant. So I, I read that, but I also love, um, so I read both of Jordan Harper's recently. So The Last King of California and A Lesson in Violence. So I really want to read his new one. And uh, Gary Disher is another um, author, which I've come to recently. He's Australian. So uh, writes a series about a detective called Hirsch and he's got a new one out in August which I need to bribe Viper I need to bribe Miranda to give oh, yeah. him oh, yeah. somehow bribe her because I'm desperate for his new one I just absolutely I love him I love Australian yeah. stuff and um who was the romantic comedy by Curtis Sitton oh uh, okay yeah 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 but yeah yeah really yes. good yeah, I love yes. the idea of using a romantic comedy as like a palate cleanser in between <laughs> I'd, I'd love to write a romance, but I I would argue, but the 20 and the Echo Man are both basically romances, but with a few bodies thrown in. I'd love to write a romance. And I tried and I was explaining it to my agent and he said, but you can't kill anyone. I was like, oh, so, oh. <laughs> so that, that then evolved into a detective story, which is uh, the other name I write under. But um, but yeah, no, so I do love a good romance. Well, I've just come back from Crime Fest. I think Sam, you were there. I just somehow managed to miss you. I don't know how. Um, <laughs> and I bought The Vanishing of Class 3B, which is Jackie Cabler's uh -huh. book. Um, but it's got a great hook about the. Uh, yeah, the I've got that to read yeah. as well. Yeah. That's fun. And, and I've also just, I'm still, I know, I'm, I'm late with it. The People Watcher. Oh, oh yes. I've got, ah, I've got that yeah. one on the go that I'm trying to get that's really I really like that at the minute that's really interesting and I'm trying to get to CJ Tudor's book The Drift before but I I yeah I love her books but um I'm a bit behind with reading at the moment because it's really hard to do that and write and do everything like life and in between <laughs> indeed <laughs> How about you, Leslie? Have you read anything this week? Well, like Alice, I've read The People Watcher and we're having Sam Lloyd um, on the on the podcast soon. Um, I've also, um, I'm looking forward to reading The Dead Mile, which is um, Joe Furness's. Oh, yeah, uh, Joe's new one. Uh, I read an early draft of that, actually. It's brilliant. It's really good. Oh, did you? That's about, um, um, it's a murder mystery set on a gridlocked motorway. So yeah. That's that's right. I read the book for that. Brilliant. Yeah. I was on a panel with her at Crime Fest. By the way, earlier when in our introduction, I completely got my panel. I forgot to mention that um, Simon Toyne was on the panel as well and Nev, Nev Fountain. And I've, I've actually got a book by Nev Fountain called Painkiller which um, I'm looking forward to reading. It's um, about a character who suffers from chronic neuropathic pain. Every second of her life is spent in agony. 
However, there are whole years of her life which are a blur to her. But when she finds what appears to be her own, her own suicide note, Mona, Monica begins to question everything. And heard him speak about that, and it sounded really fascinating. And they, I, I went, went to buy a copy, and they'd sold out. So he gave me his copy and signed oh, it. So thank oh, you, yes. Nev. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also um, I'm reading. Um, it's not. It's an older novel. It came out in 2019. I'm reading The Closer I Get by Paul Burston um, because I, I explained earlier in our introduction. I thought Paul Burston was on a panel with me, but it was actually some, a, a debut novelist called Paul Durston. And I'd started <laughs> reading Paul's book, but it's that I'm, I'm loving it. That's uh, it's about a gay novelist who becomes the target of an online stalker, and it's really well written. So I'd thoroughly recommend that one what about you nikki what have um, you got? well i finished um this one talking about prisons um which is called behind these doors um by alex south she was um a prison officer um and i mentioned it i think in um, one of our other episodes but i finished reading it now and um yeah it's absolutely fascinating um like you were saying alice i think working in a prison um you just yeah you get to see every every aspect of human society and um it was just really interesting hearing um you know as as prison officers i think um how the industry has changed if you like and how much more pressurized it is and difficult to kind of cope with and you know the overcrowding in prisons and the conditions are really bad and um you know it's yeah it's it's just really it's really interesting she writes very balanced kind of point of view and um yeah i i found that fascinating um and then i've also read uh kaz freer's um five bad deeds which um comes out uh, not until 2024 um but yeah brilliant really 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 good really really good read so thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it yes um so i think that we probably have to draw our session to a close now so thank you both very much for coming to talk to us today um and we wish you both lots of luck and success with your latest books so just to remind everybody that's the serial killer's sister by alice hunter there we go you can see it on screen if you're watching us on youtube and we've got the 20 by sam holland which is sounds fabulous so yes Yes, it's been a really interesting chat and I'm afraid Alice stole my joke. Um, uh, <laughs> she, did, she didn't steal it because she didn't know I was going to make it. But um, I was just I was going to say I'm just off to a write, write a book called The Serial Killer's Second Cousin Once Removed and Her 21 Victims. Um, <laughs> anyway, but I know fear not, I will not be writing any serial killer novels anytime soon, but I shall certainly enjoy continuing to read your two <laughs> because they're really great. And um, uh, um yeah so i think that's that's about time well. isn't it if you've enjoyed today's episode then please rate and review on whatever platform you're listening on so that others can find us that's right so now it's thank thank you for both coming on and goodbye from alice hunter bye <laughs> goodbye from sam holland bye bye <laughs> goodbye from nikki smith bye and it's goodbye from me bye bye, bye.